So, would you like to introduce yourself real quick? Hello, my name is Craig Ballinger, and I am the Regents Professor for General Education and Core at UAT. And so, do you have any pets? Do I have pets? Yeah, I do. I have uh, I have three pets, all cats. Uh, I had four up until last month. Unfortunately, I lost my 18-year-old cat. Uh, but yes, I have I have pets. Ah, and what are their names? Well, first we have Smokey, mm -hmm. short for Smokey Robinson, uh, and then we have his brother Thor. They're litter mates. Uh, Thor is unlike his name, uh, quite cowardly, uh, but he's also the bigger but younger brother. And then I have Buster, who rules the roost. Mm -hmm. And then Kitty was the one that we lost uh, last month. Oh, yeah. I'm, I'm sorry to hear that. That's okay. That's okay. He lived a very long life. He was 18, so he, he did pretty well. Hmm. And do you have any hobbies you do in your free time? I have more hobbies than pets. Um, I'm a collector, and I'm not sure exactly when it started, but my earliest memories are of me gathering all of the comic books between my brother and myself, actually both of my brothers and myself, and cataloging them. Uh, and then it turned very quickly to baseball uh, and baseball cards. Uh, I had, you know, some other uh, Star Wars cards and some other stuff, but you know, the little uh, trading cards. Uh, those were really huge hobbies for me when I was younger. Uh, and then I discovered the Beatles when I was in sixth grade. And uh, that really touched off uh, an obsession with, with music. And I've never really been able to separate being a collector from being a music lover. In other words, if I love something, I also have to have a copy of it. Uh, so yeah, I've, I've got a lot. I'm also a rare book collector. Um, I've got many, many books that I've collected through the years, uh, autograph copies, first editions, autograph first editions. Uh, and that began a little bit after college, uh, as soon as I could start to afford you know, a little bit more for, for rare books. I also collect film art, so my home uh, has many uh, posters that are the original uh, movie theater posters for you know, some of my favorite films like Stalker, Apocalypse Now, uh, the Shining, Poltergeist, uh, a couple of foreign film posters in there as well. Hmm. Yeah, and I haven't even finished telling you all about my <laughs> hobbies. I've got many. But yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm a big collector, and I collect uh, in general. And I, by the way, I still collect baseball cards and comic books as well. It's a little different. I don't really uh, collect them in the way that I did when I was a kid, uh, but I have some very specific items I'm always kind of looking for, and that's kind of my relationship with pop culture is to kind of archive it and catalog it, you know, kind of a cultural anthropologist in that respect. Cool. And you said this started around when you were in college? Well, the, the rare books did. Uh, you know, when when you get to <laughs> this level of, of uh, collecting, uh, they start to attach um, the, the suffix mania to it. So bibliomania, the mania of, of collecting books. Um, that's one that really began uh, when I started working in bookstores, and I was working in a uh, bookstore that uh, we, we had an exhibit at a rare book, an antiquarian book uh, convention, and I started looking around and realizing, oh wait, I love that book, uh, Prayer for Own Meanie, for example, by John Irving, which I'd read in paperback, and then I looked at the first edition, and there was just something about it. It was like, oh, I get it. So this is this is the the version that first came out. Sometimes they're collectible. Sometimes they're just for you know sentimental reasons why people collect them. Uh, but yeah, it, for for a long time, I really kind of focused on all you know collecting all of my authors in their first editions. That can be an extremely expensive hobby. All of these can, but I mean, book prices can be outrageous, thousands of dollars, which I I, I don't have any like that. But. Okay, so what were any of the maybe challenges you faced while you were like a student during those times, and did, how did you overcome some of those? As a college student, the challenges were pretty immense. Uh, I tried going to college a couple of times when I was 18. Uh, it, it didn't work. I wasn't a very good student. I was kind of a lazy high school student. I was one of those people that uh, sort of got through just on, on their wits alone. Uh, and the occasional, you know, uh, flash of insight just in the nick of time. Um, and I would complete enough work. So I was kind of like a C and B student in high school. 
and uh, that carried over into college. So as soon as I started college, I just carried on with the exact same uh, behaviors and that didn't work out so well. So what I learned very quickly was that I was much more interested in uh, kind of, you know, wandering around the country and going on adventures than I was doing homework. So I went ahead and gave into that. And I would, at the beginning of every semester, uh, for about roughly about two years, I would enroll in classes. I would attend them sort of occasionally, sometimes pass the classes. And then uh, at some point I found myself working. I, you know, was getting a little older. I wanted to, to, you know, be able to afford a bit more of a lifestyle than an adult would have instead of, you know, relying on, on 50 bucks here and there from my parents um, and all these part-time jobs. So I started working on construction sites and I did carpet for a while. I installed carpet and uh, more importantly when you when you start installing carpet you don't actually start installing carpet you actually start by tearing out the old stinky carpet from the <laughs> from the work sites. So um, I did that for for about six months and that taught me very quickly uh, one that I have a capacity for doing labor and working on these you know construction sites uh, but it also taught me that the what I thought was hard work going to class, being there on time and doing my homework wasn't actually that difficult, not compared to what I was in for. So I made a quick choice and uh, I got a lucky uh, windfall uh, inheritance and I started going to the University of Arizona. So that was my, you know, that was, that was the big challenge was just getting to college and actually taking it seriously. Once I did, uh, I, I won't say it became easy because the, the classes were, were very difficult, but it really did change my life and change my outlook on things and pretty much led me to, to you know where I am now. Yeah, and yeah. you're a teacher here at the University of Advancing Technology. I am. So what is it that you teach here on campus? So what I teach here on campus, actually I also teach some online courses as well, uh, and they're generally just mirror what I, what I teach uh, in person. Um, they reflect all of my academic pursuits. So uh, I actually began my undergraduate career as a philosophy major, because uh, you know you're 18 and clever, and so of course naturally you want to, you think you're going to be a, a philosophy uh, student or even a philosopher, um, and that changed pretty rapidly into uh, a creative writing degree. So my undergraduate degree is in is in creative writing, and I did a lot of uh, professional writing and then you know editing and, and a lot of that later after I finished that degree, uh, and so that side of my academic pursuits uh, is seen in creative writing courses that I teach. Uh, I also have academic backgrounds in literature and in uh, basically technology and society with a focus on ethics. And so I teach a, a technology, society, and ethics course that is required of all students at UAT. It's part of our core. Uh, and I've been teaching that for 10 years. I think I, I counted up the other day. I probably taught close to 5,000 students in that class. Uh, and then the other side, which is the humanities and literature, I teach um, genre literature courses, basically. So I teach science fiction, I teach gothic literature, um, and then I also have a couple of other courses, uh, crime, crime writing. Uh, uh, and then I'm teaching currently a class in the 1980s. It's my newest class. It's in the, the culture of the 1980s, the popular culture. And then I also teach a class called Countercultures, which looks at the post-war... Uh, culture through the late 1970s into the early 1980s. So I have a lot of different classes that I teach, but mostly in the in the humanities. All right. So what is motivating you to you know be a teacher here and you know spread this knowledge? That's a that's a really good question. Uh, what drives me to continue doing this and you know uh, working with students? It it's the students themselves, ultimately. Uh, there's, there's a few other reasons, just my pursuit of knowledge. I mean, somebody is allowing me to come into a class and talk about the clash and the shining and these things that I love, you know? And so that's a really exciting thing to, to wake up to every day. It's like, I'm actually getting paid to do this, to talk about these things, right? Um, but what keeps it from getting boring and what maintains sort of my excitement is really working with students. It, it, it's very, um, they can be very insightful. Young people and, and some of my older students, obviously, the, the insights that come out of students 
are constantly teaching me kind of what I don't know about the subjects that I teach, and, and they open up doors for areas of, of things that I, you know, for further inquiry that I can look into. Yeah, so it's, um, it's, it's kind of like a, you know, it's a chess game in a, in a lot of ways. You, you know the moves, you know what you should do, you know what all the, play, or the parts can do, but what's coming next is often up in the air, and the students are masters, you know, at playing chess with me. So it's, it's really interesting, and, and any student that's ever taken uh, one of my courses, you recognize that there are moments when I'm getting a little, um, maybe not, not quite bored with the class, but I've gone down a familiar road so many times I want to try something interesting. And so I'll, I'll throw the, the playbook out and we'll just have a conversation about something very relevant to the class, but also something that the students want to talk about. So. It's, it's, that, it's that sort of interplay. That's what keeps me coming back every day. And it's, it's pretty exciting. It definitely makes it worthwhile. So then out of all of the classes that you teach, uh, which, one, which ones have the best projects with the students that you most enjoy? The classes that I teach with the best projects or the ones that I most enjoy uh, include creative writing. Um, the, the students, it's a 200 and a 300 level course, and so I've got beginner students and advanced students, and they workshop only a couple of short stories throughout the, the 15 weeks of the course. But by the time we get to the end of that class, they've really spent a lot of time not just working on those manuscripts, but listening to their critics, the other students, and, and myself. Uh, you know, I, I, I act as sort of an editor, but also a, a peer. We're all writers in that room. By the time that class is getting to the last about four or five weeks, it really feels like everyone in there considers themselves a writer. And so as we work towards those final stories and those final critique sessions, what I call roundtable sessions, everyone in that class is fully engaged and they're feeling like what they have to write and what they have to say is really important. Hands down, that's one of the best experiences uh, of, of my, you know, my career. Um, the other ones are ultimately any time that I allow students to be creative. So in other words, it's not, you know, what do you, what, what, just what do you know, just say it in, in an essay form. It's what do you know, but express it to me in a way that you feel comfortable expressing it to me. It could be a painting, it could be a song, it could be a script, uh, it could be some digital art assets, it could be a game. There's all kinds of ways to express to, to your instructor what you know that doesn't have to follow this kind of standard academic, uh, uh, I, some, sorry, sometimes I think of it as nonsense, <laughs> of like the essay or just kind of the standard academic forms of, of communication. I look for much more personal expressions. Those projects really slay me every time. They're, they're always amazing. Students can really come up with some, some stuff that just leaves me with my jaw on the floor. So would you say that's one of the things that makes UAT different from other colleges? I can certainly say that my college experience prior to UAT involved none of this. Uh, it often involved uh, an instructor who was at the, you know, they were the authority in the room and, and my perspective wasn't really, it's not that it wasn't valued, um, you know, it was certainly assessed, but it wasn't really part of the learning environment. Uh, and, and so, we're always encouraged here to make the student experience part of the experience for the whole class um, and to to draw on what students you know can do and, and can do best um, i i don't have a lot to compare it to but my own personal experience involved none of that very very good mm -hmm. thank you very much for your time today you're welcome